So today we're going to do some high resolution imaging of the surface of Jupiter. Now the process we're going to use is called lucky imaging and the problem is that when we image through the Earth's atmosphere the surfaces, the high resolution views that we want to get are distorted by turbulence in the atmosphere. So what we're going to do is use a high speed camera and this records at tens of frames a second, hundreds of frames a second and we're going to capture over several minutes thousands of still frames in that video file. We're then going to use free software it will sort through those that video file and it will reject all of them that are blurred by the atmosphere. We'll keep the sharpest, we'll stack them together one on top of the other and then we'll process the sharpest frames and then reveal hidden details, details that you simply cannot see you know, through the eyepiece. So tonight we're going to have a look at the equipment I use. We're going to set up a piece of freeware called Fire Capture to capture the imagery and then make sure you stay to the end because I've got some tips on how to get the best out of your planetary images. So this is my Celestron C11, this is what I use for my lunar and planetary imaging and it's a really nice telescope to use for that. It's quite a compact design but it's still got quite a serious aperture. So that's the ASI224 camera. It's a good size camera, it's an affordable camera and we don't need a really big field of view for imaging the moon and for the planets. Craters are small, Jupiter, Mars are quite small and angular size, you don't need a very big chip. So it's quite an affordable little camera. Now CMOS cameras like this, these high speed planetary cameras are very sensitive into the infrared. So you have to then use an infrared cut filter. This is just the ZWAP, but the same people who made the camera. And that cuts out, stops the infrared light from coming through to the camera. And that gives us a cleaner, less bloated image. So an IR cut filter, you can get different filters depending on what wavelength you want to image at, but it's an IR cuts filter, just lets the optical light come through so you get a nice white light image. So this camera that I use is an ASI224, that's a one shot colour camera, so I don't have to worry about using different filters, having a filter wheel in there, shooting in red, green and blue. And to be honest with you, I'm finding it actually works really well. I don't know what the improvement would be uh, if I had a you know mono camera and had shot in different filters. It certainly seems to alleviate a lot of the hassle and a lot of the cost and a lot of the effort having a one shot colour but without necessarily having a loss of performance. So one of the downsides of a Schmidt Cassegrain is they focus by moving the primary mirror and that leads to mirror flop as you adjust which direction you're focusing in. So one of the first accessories I bought was an aftermarket uh, Crayford focuser, this is the Skywatcher OVL version and that provides the focus without the mirror flipping around. So I use, I focus, you know, if I'm changing from eyepiece to camera or putting the Barlow in, I'll then use the primary mirror to focus and when I'm in the right spot I can then do my fine focus with the Crayford focuser without the mirror moving the image around. And when I was getting into planetary imaging I soon found that whenever you touch the telescope to check the focus, of course, the image would dance all over the screen as your hand touched the focusing wheel. So I then got a focuser, a, this is just the Skywatcher auto focuser, and this is so useful to have vibration free uh, focusing. You can really see when those fine details are visible. So I put a 12 volt to 9 volt DC to DC convert on there. That means I could then run the focuser on the same power supply that I use for my mount and for the dew heaters. And that's one of the best accessories I've ever bought when you're trying to judge when you've got fine focus, particularly if the seeing's bad, to have that vibration free ability to do that is absolutely invaluable. The next thing I found was really hard was trying to get that tiny little disc of Jupiter or Mars or whatever I'm looking at onto a tiny little chip so having a flip mirror is really useful. So what this does is it has a mirror inside. So the light comes down here, you put the mirror into the light path that brings it up to the eyepiece. So I then line up with the finder telescope, get that in the eyepiece, and then you lift, lift the mirror out of the way and the light then travels all the way through to the camera itself. Next thing I put on there was an atmospheric dispersion corrector. So the light comes through from the planet or the star or whatever it is you're looking at, hits the atmosphere and that then acts a bit like a prism. You get red fringing and blue fringing. And the atmospheric dispersion corrector has two prisms inside and they rotate against each other and you can judge then how to counteract that effect of the atmosphere and that nullifies 
the red and the blue fringing. So the other thing I've done is put a Barlow lens in the um, screwed it onto the front of the flip mirror. So the problem is if you put that into a Barlow lens and your lens is actually over here somewhere and you get all this extra image amplification. So by unscrewing the Barlow lens from the Barlow body and threading it onto the front of the flip mirror means that that in effect has become the new Barlow body. So it's slightly bigger than it would be normally. Another train goes past. So it's slightly bigger than it would be normally, but you're not getting over amplification. So one of the downsides of the Vixen uh, flip mirror, which I've got here, is that the threads are the wrong size. So uh, filters and Barlow lenses and all that sort of thing, I think are M48 threads. Um, for Vixen, for some reason, they've decided to go for M49, which is what the photographers use. M49 is a much more uh, common standard in cameras, uh, conventional cameras. Uh, so annoyingly, a friend of mine had to machine up the adapter so that I could then thread an M48 Barlow body onto an M49 flip mirror. So I can't really recommend the Vixen uh, flip mirror. Of course, I didn't know that when I bought it. Uh, so thanks to Bob for his machining so I can then put my Barlow on the front of that. So do check that. Do check what which one you go for. So we have a Celestron C11, a Crayford Focuser with a Scarwitch autofocuser, motorized focuser as well to give us a nice uh, vibration free focusing with a flip mirror so we can use that to line up on the planets with an atmospheric dispersion corrector so we get rid of that red blue fringing onto the camera itself and then with an infrared cup filter just to give a cleaner sharper image. So with a cup of tea in hand we're going to open up a fire capture on the computer we're going to go into the settings and we're going to adjust two of the settings. The first is to use universal time. And this means wherever you are in the world, whatever time zone you're in, whether it's daylight saving time or not, fire capture will save in universal time. So you don't have to worry about those time and date corrections. The second thing we're going to do is use the WinDupos naming convention. Now, when we come on to image processing, one of the things we're going to do when we've stacked sorted, stacked, sharpened our images. We can put a few of these together, the very best images, into WinDupos and produce a much better, much cleaner image by stacking several together. The problem is that WinDupos needs to know the date, the time, the minute, the second that those images were captured and therefore you have to manually type it in. If you use the WinDupos naming convention, WinDupos literally just reads off the file names. So you don't have to type it all in. So, I've just swung the telescope across to Jupiter. I can't really see anything in there. Somewhere in there is, oh, there we are, there's Jupiter, and there is Io. That's me just holding the camera up to the eyepiece. That's Jupiter and Io. What I'm going to do now, this is my flip mirror, and I'm going to rotate the flip mirror. And there you can see Jupiter has appeared on the screen. Jupiter and Io, so let's adjust the focus there. So I'm just gonna, so I'm just gonna focus using the motorized focuser. That, that's not looking too bad, so there. Looks really good, so we've got Jupiter up on the screen, focusing on, I'm not using any masks, I'm not using anything other than just looking with the eye. Just looking at the limb of the planet, seeing um, how sharp I can get it, seeing if there's any of that small features on the on the surface of Jupiter, just trying to get the sharpest image I possibly can. Next thing we've got to do is use the atmospheric dispersion corrector. So that is the atmospheric dispersion corrector set up. So I've got that pointing horizontally to the right, and I've adjusted these levers equal and opposite so that that then balances out the red and the blue atmospheric dispersion. So we'll go to colour mode. Oh, that's not looking too bad already. There it is, we're in colour. So we've got Jupiter nice and sharp on the screen. I've adjusted the atmospheric dispersion corrector. So I've got the red and the blue, uh, the red and the blue channels are now aligned. I've done my fine focus with the motorized focuser 
And really the only thing to do now is just start capturing a whole load of frames. So we'll turn all that off. So let's do a region of interest. Should probably do. Perfect. Give one last little tweak on the focus. I always like checking a few times. Go through focus out one side into the other. I think that's about right. Be nice and centered. 120 seconds SER, I've got my histogram, two thirds roughly is about right. And if I go to the D bed, I'm not oversaturating any of the pixels. That's looking pretty good. That little moon there, beautiful. 120 seconds, 350, 10 milliseconds. I'm not overexposed, I'm not underexposing. And just press capture. So the other thing to do now is just to just to wait. I think that's our bar now going past again. Just hear it in the distance. Beautiful. Here we are outside, looking at the beauty of the solar system, looking at Jupiter, looking at this moon reappearing from behind the the, the limb of Jupiter. And you also get to hear a barn owl hunting in the fields nearby. So if you want to capture a whole load of Jupiters, one after the other, and then stack them together, and we'll come back onto that later, rather than having to manually press record each and every time, that is quite a useful feature, which is the time-lapse. So I've set mine up with, I'm going to do 30 runs of limit is two minutes, 120 seconds, and I've got a one minute rest in between. So every three minutes we're doing a capture, starting a capture and then just hit start auto run. And you can leave this running well for as long as you really want to. You can capture video after video after video for however you want to set it up. So you can see there while we wait for the video to reset for the next one in the time lapse just how much Jupiter's jumping around in the seeing and it's not a particularly good scene tonight um, but you can see some of the small features on Jupiter and you can see that the disk of Io is not a it's not a point it's not a stellar point it's actually a proper disk it's jumping around a bit in the tournaments now there goes the next capture So it's jumping around in the turbulence and that is literally the seeing. And that's the whole beauty of this process, is that by capturing with the high-speed camera, the software will reject those blurry frames and will only stack the sharp ones together. So a few other tips for your consideration as well. So I keep my telescope in an observatory, it's ready to go as soon as I roll the roof back. And what I felt, what I've noticed is that if uh, before I built the observatory and I skipped telescope in the house, when you had to set it up outside, I had to let it cool down, cool down to ambient, so that you didn't get tube currents inside the telescope. And that would then, you get a heat haze from the nice warm optics, and that would again disrupt the seeing those high resolution views. So keeping the telescope in the shed, just as a train goes past, so keeping the telescope in the shed helps keep it an ambience and before I built the observatory I just set up an hour or two beforehand. I've also put a metal uh, space blanket heating, uh, what do you call it, an insulative blanket over the top silver foil blanket and that's to stop the telescope from overcooling. So we've got a metal uh, alu aluminium or aluminium in your case uh, tube. So I've got a, a metal telescope here and that will then radiate up to the colder deep space and that can actually super cool, cool below the ambient air temperature. You then get cold air currents coming down the telescope tube. So this metal foil thing here is just to stop that, to alleviate that happening, it stops the telescope from overcooling and uh, building up those tube currents inside the tube. The other important thing to do is to make sure you're collimated. Now collimation is a video in its own right uh, so I'm not going to go through that now, but do make sure you've got the telescope collimated. You won't get nice sharp images if your telescope optics are misaligned. 
So every now and again, every few imaging runs, I will just quickly check that I am still nicely collimated, that the, the star, the out of focus star, is still nice and concentric. And then I can tweak the uh, collimation screws at the front of the telescope just to bring that into line. But being in an observatory, it doesn't move around that much. So well collimated, telescope cooled to ambient, not overcooled by having a metal, by having the space blanket over the top. And the other important thing to mention as well is I'm quite lucky where I am, we're on the edge of the town, edge of uh, Salisbury, and I'm shooting out over fields. Uh, so you don't get a lot of heat haze coming off that you would do from buildings and parking lots and roofs. It's all been sitting in the nice warm you know, sun. They're then radiating out to the cooler space. So being able to shoot over fields and trees and countryside uh, does as well improve the seeing. So I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you found that useful. I've got uh, a hard drive now full of planetary data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make another video of how I process this down to record all that fine detail. So make sure you subscribe. And talking of which, I've been reviewing the YouTube statistics and there's loads of people who watch these videos but don't subscribe. There's no cost involved. I don't charge for this. I don't have a Patreon account. But if you do subscribe, then YouTube picks up those statistics and then shares it with more people. So please do subscribe and I'll bring you more videos as we explore the night sky.